Starting in the 1950s, the user became a focus of design discourse. This manifested in two senses. Firstly, burgeoning consumerism in the U.S. gave rise to the field of motivation research, used by marketers and manufacturers in an attempt to uncover new ways of targeting consumers and boosting sales. This period also witnessed a growing interest in ergonomics or human factors relating to the design of products and spaces. Where the sole aim of motivation research was to increase product sales, ergonomics concerned itself with enhancing users' sense of well-being, improved safety, and ease of use. Into this context stepped Alexander Kira, a professor of architecture at Cornell University. In 1966, Kira and his team at Cornell completed a six-year, $100,000 study of the bathroom and published the results in a book titled The Bathroom. An expanded version published in 1976 included chapters on public restrooms and restrooms for people with disabilities. Kira described the conventions of bathroom facilities design as archaic, inadequate, unhealthy, and unsafe. Bathroom design, he argued, was determined solely by trade practices, out-of-date reference books and handbooks, and market research done by manufacturers of bathroom products. In Kira's view, humans' fundamental needs regarding personal hygiene hadn't changed much since antiquity, but the strategies used to accommodate those needs had varied greatly throughout history, dictated more by social climate and religious and philosophical attitudes towards the body and its waste than by advances in technology. He felt that bathroom-related technology lagged behind because of a lack of demand, which ultimately stemmed from a collective unwillingness to earnestly examine the body and its processes. Taboo and the tendency of designers to treat bathrooms as an afterthought were getting in the way of realizing human well-being. In the preface to the bathroom, he writes, The architects and builders, who actually are the purchasers and who actually are responsible for the design of our bathrooms, must begin to think of hygiene facilities as an important part of the home and as an important aspect of our daily lives, rather than as a necessary evil to be accommodated according to the dictates of some obsolete handbook or drawing template in whatever space is left over with whatever part of the budget is minimally required to meet legal standards. The ultimate tragedy is that here, as in so many other aspects of human existence, all too many of us have allowed our taboos and guilts to interfere with the fullest development and realization of our physical and mental well-being. Kira and his team undertook a multidisciplinary literature review of the subject, as well as a study of current attitudes, practices, and problems, including a survey of 1,000 middle-class households. Research included monitoring the performance of hygiene tasks in a lab, then recording an analysis and description. Kira and his team filmed live subjects with and without bathroom equipment to determine the bodily motions associated with each activity. Based on their findings, they formulated criteria and recommendations for the bathroom, and also developed experimental equipment. I researched Alexander Kier's method and design solution that he proposed within the bathroom. I broke it down into four categories such as sink, bathtub, shower, and water closet. In each category, I will explain the idea behind the testing and how the experiment aided into the design solution. Some common themes that you will see is his idea of comfort and hygiene. First, I will start with the sink. The study involved the observation of volunteer subjects under control conditions. The subjects were asked to wash their hands and head under two different conditions. One without water to simulate how the hand and body interacted and the second included using water. Under the current dimensions of the sink, washing your head was on carpal, so a new design was proposed. The new design measured the arc of the water which hit the center convex point in the new design proposal, as seen in the slide. The new design was deep in the back and wide in the front to allow more room for the user's head and arms. To end this slide, I'm going to talk about his design possibilities. Although the lavatory must, from a particular viewpoint, accommodate a wide range of person hygiene act activities from hand and face washing to hair washing, grooming, and oral hygiene is an essential face washing that poses the most severe demand in normal usage and hence can be regarded as the basic determinant of the design criteria. In my next slide, I'm going to explore the bathtub. The design study looked at two different aspects. First one is getting in and out. Because a bathtub, by definition, must be a vessel capable of containing the body and quantity of water significant to cover most of the body, its dimensions become such that even getting in and out of a tub needs to be regarded as a major component of the overall activity. It is a maneuver that is difficult from person to person and potentially hazardous 
for all. The second is relaxing. Relaxing the top is largely a matter of assuming a passive and static position in which the body is relieved of all muscular tension and strain. This results when the individual stable positions are assumed by achieving the lowest center of gravity and providing support for every body segment, including the head. The test involved measuring how comfortable the back was by moving the angle 5 degrees starting at 90 to see what works the best. The overall design of the tub can be seen in this slide. Where the back of the tub is designed to reflect the curve of the person's spine to be comfortable while laying down. The next design solution he focused on was getting in and out of the bathtub. As you can see through the picture on the right, the regular bathtub is in a square shape. He found that it's difficult to step in and out, so he proposed his new idea. His new idea created a convex shape that was easier on the feet as well as easier to clean. The next topic is the shower. In this method, they had a subject wash themselves. They noticed a few problems starting at washing your feet and the amount of space a user has within the shower is limited. To accommodate a user, a seat and a full rest are proposed, as well as widening the shower and adding vertical supports for entering and leaving the shower. Finally, adding a sense of control with adjustable shower head. His design proposal can be seen in the slides. And finally, the water closet. The study started with the participant in a particular posture. A full free squatting posture for defecation practiced most of the world's population is ideal for the viewpoint of psychological functioning. This posture is uncustomed and difficult one for most Western people to assume. To accommodate the seated position, Kerr proposed a few different water closets that would support the user in a squatting position as seen in the illustrations. Hygiene is another element that Alexander Kerr looked at throughout his design development. The image in the slide shows how he designed a water closet. He believed that the curved edge at the bottom and the seat joints contained a high level of bacteria. To help clean the toilet, he designed and focused on clean curved base and a lidless toilet seat that integrated both male and female needs. Kira understood the intersection of personal hygiene with human sexuality and sexual practices. His work addresses the psychosexual aspects of hygiene in a tone that's generally non-judgmental and not overly specific to gender or sexuality. While the book is known as a work that pushed the boundaries of taboo by the very nature of its topic and approach, one wonders if it might have done more to shed light on non-heteronormative practices and the body rituals associated with them. Alexander Kira's proposals were met with widespread critical praise, but ultimately his ideas did not become mainstream. After all, bathrooms today look much the same as they did before Kira's study. Consumer desires tended to center around the idea of more space, gadgetry, and fashionable decor. As Barbara Penner notes in Place's journal, in short, people long for a Hollywood-style luxury bathroom whose excesses Kira deplored. Needless to say, no respondent expressed a desire for a more physiologically correct way of defecating. Schisms between consumer benefit and consumer desires continue today as researchers and designers grapple with the question of what drives demand and how to access it. Although people might understand intellectually what's quote-unquote good for them, there remains a range of reasons why they might accept or reject certain practices and products. Say, you got to be clean. Uh -oh. To be on the scene, grab your rug, grab your soap, scrub your hand, scrub your face, scrub your side, scrub your back, scrub your front, wash your foot, wash your face.